Welcome to the Language Games Podcast. My name is John Kaus. Today is part 13 of our Van Til's Apologetic series. Last week, we discussed point one, that Van Til's Apologetic can be presented in two distinct ways, one direct, the other indirect. We continue on now to point two, and that is that the topic of self-deception is not central to Van Til's Apologetic. Bonson, in his dissertation for his PhD at USC, wrote on self-deception. And it's, it's wonderful. He did great work in this area, and it had, and he, but he chose the work because Van Til was often troubled um, <clears throat> with the, the truth that the unbeliever knows God and yet doesn't know God, okay? And, and how, he, how self-deception, self-deception plays a key role in this. Uh, he writes, there is no question that scripture teaches this complex view of the unbeliever. He does not know God, being an unbeliever who repudiates the truth of God's revelation. Nevertheless, he does, in fact, know God very well. Because both, both sides of this complex situation are biblically based, Van Til is to be uh, commended for incorporating them into the heart of his apologetic. But notice, though, this isn't at the heart of Van Til's apologetic. Now, I gave the argument in, in great detail, in its deductive form, the, the, the direct version of it, and nowhere did we have to talk about this problem. Now, someone could have objected, right, and said that, hey, this seems to show that the unbeliever you know, knows God and doesn't know God, and we could deal with that objection. But notice that's no more at the heart of the apologetic than the problem of evil. The problem of evil at that point would be, is just as fundamental as would be this objection and a whole host of other objections. So this is a more of a particular objection just against Christianity and the Christianity that Van Til is presenting. It's not inherent to the structure of the argument. So I just want to clarify that. Not, it's not to tear down Bonson's work. Like, it's great. Uh, it's a seminal work in apologetics on self-deception. And it should be referenced and used uh, greatly. And this objection is actually very common against Van Til's apologetic, most notably Alvin Plantinga. And so it's of great value to us, and we need to use it, and so I'm not trying to say this does not matter. But it should be known this is not a central issue. It is not at the heart of Van Til's apologetic. All right, so then moving on to the third one, we welcome the burden of proof. This is more just an exhortation to apologists in general, whether you're a Van Tilian or an evidentialist. And I'm going to quote Bonson here, but it's more because uh, it's to just illustrate what I'm talking about. This, I would say this is probably the, the attitude of most apologists, where they will debate or argue about you know, uh, who has the responsibility in making the case. Right? Where, where does the burden of proof lie? He says, in this special case, the burden of proof in the argument between a theist and an anti-theist would shift to the person denying God's existence, since the possibility and intelligibility of that very debate is directly affected by the position taken. My point here is that if we have a proof that Christianity is true, then just accept the burden of proof. Right? Who cares at that point? If you have a proof, then just present it and force the person to interact with it. If the proof is good, if it's valid and it's sound, then just present it. We, we don't have to quibble over who, whose burden it is. Take on the burden. Okay, we, we should welcome the burden. All right, now the fourth point is that Van Til's apologetic is a deductive argument. I suspect that this misunderstanding has almost single-handedly stalled any real progress in developing Van Til's apologetic since Bonson's death by assuming Van Til's apologetic to be some third category of argumentation. So the transcendental reasoning is some third form of argumentation. It's not inductive, it's not deductive, it's transcendental. Uh, Its development then, Van Til's development then, because it's thought to be this third category, has resided in this like undefined and often fuzzy land where logic applies, but it doesn't apply. It's deductive, but it's not. And so we just go around and around and around without making the argument any clearer. I spent many years trying to defend this uh, third category of argumentation and kept banging my head against the wall. Why was that? Because I was operating under this false assumption that it was not deductive. Once I rejected that assumption and embraced the argument as being deductive, things became much clearer and progress could, could be made. All right, Bonson writes, and we quoted this earlier, 
He writes, it should be clear from the context here that Van Til meant to claim more than that the argument is valid. That is, the conclusion follows, uh, necessarily follows from the premises. In the first place, the strong kind of argument that he is advocating would also be sound. Its premises would be true. Moreover, the truth of its premises, uh, or, or the soundness of the secondary, tertiary, etc., arguments used for these premises is acknowledged or knowable without prior acknowledgement uh, or statement of the conclusion in the formulations. Notice the language here. Valid, sound, premises, conclusion. This, these are all deductive terms. The kind of strong argument intended by Van Til represents a genuine cognitive advance because things which the unbeliever will acknowledge turn out without him realizing it upon analysis to require or imply, again, deductive, the truth of the Christian worldview. All of this language is, in, is deductive. I have no idea in this context what valid, sound, implies, premises, conclusion mean if it's, not in a de if it's not deductively, not meant deductively. And this has been my experience. If, if you talk to a Vantillian who wants to hold the argument to be some third category of argumentation, and you press him to actually give the argument or give some kind of specificity in how it works, he will, without fail, revert to deductive language. And why is that? Because the argument is deductive. All right, so switching on now to, or switching to, to Van Til, he writes, but after all, you are not, as I am not, interested in a priori deductive systems. I have argued on a number of occasions against various people to the fact that the biblical system of truth is based upon the exegesis of the authoritatively given truth, a truth content of scripture. So we're going to get into some quotes here where Van Til is against deductive-ism and deductive systems. But his emphasis, though, is that whether it's an inductive system or deductive system or he would affirm then a transcendental system, whatever you're in, what he wants to emphasize again and again, is the presuppositions in uh, back of these arguments, of these systems. So that's really what he's against. Van Til here is, is not really emphasizing whether the transcendental argument is truly distinct from the deductive. I think he thought that, and we'll see that he, he says as much in here. But notice his emphasis is not really on that. Okay? What he wants to make sure is that we are not neutral or anti-Christian in, in the starting point these hidden presuppositions of the argument. And he also wants to make sure that these deductive systems don't strip God. So if we try to take Christianity and God and put them into a deductive system, put the worldview in a deductive system, he wants to make sure that it doesn't squeeze out the mystery that's in Christianity, which is, you know, a great concern, and we should obviously be, you know, aware of that when we're doing this. But that's his concern. Okay, but none of that shows, though, that the argument is actually different, or that the, the form of a transcendental argument is actually different than a deductive argument. In fact, we're going to show that it's not. We continue on now. He says, When exegesis seems to lead into so-called antinomies, such as the relation of the all-controlling sovereignty of God to the freedom or responsibility of man, I simply admit that I cannot logically penetrate the situation. So an antinomy is just a seeming contradiction. It's not really a contradiction, but we have a hard time separating it. We have a hard time explaining it in a way that would we would just sit back and say, okay, that's, that's clear, and we move on. There's this conflict in us in understanding it. Now, it's not a real contradiction. You can't actually demonstrate the contradiction, but there's this mystery here. Or there's this limit in our understanding. And Van Til doesn't want that to go away, and I don't either. He writes, the Bible teaches God's sovereign electing grace. It also teaches the universal offer of the gospel. I cannot logically comprehend the relation between these two, but this fact does not lead me to a denial of either one of them. And amen. But logic does not require you to do that. All right, then he writes, when the Christian and his opponent use the same terminology, they do not mean the same things. And I would agree with that. Both speak of inductive, deductive, and transcendental methods. So again, here he's clearly showing these as three distinct forms. But each of them presupposes his own starting point when he uses these terms. And that fact gives these terms a different meaning in each case. It follows from this, too, that what the Christian is opposing is not these methods as such, but the anti-Christian presuppositions at the base of them. And these would really be more meta-assumptions that he's getting at, rather than assumptions in the, uh, the actual argument. All right. He goes on and says, 
if the axioms on which science depends are thought of as resting in, in the universe, the opposite of the Christian position is in effect maintained. So the axioms on which science depends, of our starting points, are all resting on our human experience, then obviously that's not Christian. And I agree with, I agree with that. Okay, now this, is, this can be a confusing to track in Van Til's writings, but Van Til clearly affirmed that the transcendental form of argumentation is distinct from inductive or deductive reasoning. But he, but he, he rarely actually talks about why that is. He just kind of assumes that, that it's that way. Most of his emphasis is that, we, again, we do not have non-Christian or anti-Christian or neutral assumptions at the starting point of whatever form of argumentation you want, and that we do not squeeze or eliminate the mystery that's in God and mystery that's in Christian doctrine by forcing it into some kind of deductive system. And to that we say amen. All right, now Bonson, though, on the other hand, was interested in how these two forms of argumentation, really deductive and transcendental, are in fact distinct. And so he, he wanted to, to get into this issue. And he did, and a lot of this, though, happened later on in, in his life. This is more, in fact, the majority of it, as far as what he, what he published, happened the last year of his life. So the Transcendental Conference he did, this is 1995, and then Van Til's Apologetic, which was finished right before he died. The bulk of his writing, writings on this and his interactions with this topic is from that period. All right, so we're going to get a little more meat from Bonson on this. He says, he writes, years ago, Van Til realized that opponents of presuppositionalism tend to think that there are only two kinds of reasoning, inductive and deductive. Deductive reasoning stands opposed to inductive. However, there is also transcendental reasoning in which the preconditions for the intelligibility of what is experienced, asserted, or argued are posed or sought. It too stands opposed to a purely inductive approach to knowledge. Critics seem to think that since presuppositionalism does not endorse pure inductivism, it must favor deductivism instead. This logical fallacy is known as false antithesis. It is extremely important to notice and reflect upon the point being made by Van Til at this juncture. As we shall see shortly, a transcendental argument has the special logical feature about it that it can draw its conclusion from the affirmation of some position or premise, or premise as well as from the denial of that position or premise. This exhibits the necessity of what the transcendental argument proves. This is not then the same as deductive necessity, since the denial of a crucial, of crucial premise and a deductive argument would render the argument invalid. All right, this is simply inaccurate. Okay, Bonson is confusing the denial of the antecedent in the implication with the denial of the actual premise. And this confusion stems from how we define what a presupposition is. What does it mean for P to presuppose Q, or for Q to be a presupposition of P? And so we're, we're going to turn to that now, which is back of what Bonson is writing here. Oliphant writes, if we were to set forth this, uh, his notion of a presupposition in general terms, talking about Van, Van Til's notion here, perhaps the Strassonian formula is the best representative. P presupposes Q if and only if Q is true, provided P is true or P is false. And this is what Bonson would also have been, been affirming in the previous quote. All right, let's dig into this. That probably wasn't meaningful for, <laughs> for many of you, so let's, let's unpack this. All right, so you have P presupposes Q. So if we say Q is a presupposition of P, we are also saying P presupposes Q. Well, what does that mean? Well, what we just read is that if P is true or not P is true, then Q is true, okay? Q follows from the truth of P or the falsehood of P. All right, so then notice this though. <laughs> this is the same as Q, logically. This is missed. This is often missed. Stay with this, okay? The proposition, if P or not P, then Q, is logically the same as Q. Okay, so we have this conditional. The left side, the antecedent, is P or not P, which is obviously always true. Okay, P or not P is always true. The right side is Q. The conditional, or the implication, is the then, okay, the if-then. We'll just put under the then. Now notice, though, okay, so the left side is true, 
Always true. Q then, what possible truth values does Q have? True or false, right? Q can be true or false. And then the left side is always true. Okay, so then just we're just gonna go through each row individually. So when is an if then false? And if then is only false or an implication is only false when the left side is true and the right side is false. You may never, a falsehood may never follow from a truth. A falsehood may never follow from a truth. And in, in uh, propositional logic with implications, then every other uh, combination of truth values is, is, is acceptable. So if the left side is false, then the right side can be true or false and the implication is still true. And if the left side is true and the right side is true, then the implication is also still true. The only time it's false, the only time the implication is false is when the left side is true and the right side is false. Well, look at this then. The first row, the left side is true, the right side is true. So what is the implication? It's true. All right, now the left side, second row, left side is true, right side is false. The implication then is false. Well, notice then, compare the truth values of the then and the Q. They're the same. So then, the whole proposition, if P or not P, then Q, is logically equivalent to Q. So if you start an argument with P presupposes Q, and by this you really just mean if P or not P, then Q, and you want to conclude Q, it's circular reasoning. You've started with Q. If P or not P, then Q is logically equivalent to Q. So if someone said, hey, prove to me Q, you say, well, uh, P presupposes Q. That's just to say Q. You've just started with Q. Now, this needs to be understood, okay? Because if we, if we present P presupposes Q like this, and for Van Til's definition of presupposition, then we are, God forbid, committing fallacious circular reasoning. Well, what's wrong with this? Well, what's wrong with this is you don't have to have P or not P imply Q for it to be a presupposition. That is an inaccurate statement or, or a description of what a presupposition is. To, to get at a presupposition, you have to get at it's one stating something we can show in the system, but also something unique about it outside the system. See, presuppositions must be assumptions outside the system. So they are what you might call a meta-assumption. Okay, a meta-assumption. So, and this is where things will get a little tricky uh, formally, but, and we'll get into that in, in a future um, episode, a few episodes from this net. We'll, we'll clarify this because it needs to be cleaned up. All right. Now, as we go, go back to this, so if P or not P, then Q. Question obviously becomes that if someone were to say, show you by a truth table, hey, this is really just Q. Okay, this by saying, um, you know, God, God is a presupposition of all knowledge, or the truth of Christianity is a presupposition of all knowledge, uh, is really just to state that Christianity is true. Okay, then if someone sh was to show you that, Mr. Van Tilian, then you would still be left with what? Well, to prove the truth of Christianity, which is what you're supposed to prove in the first place. All right, so what you would do then is you would start with breaking up P presupposes Q. You'd break it up into the two implications that make it up. You'd list those. Now notice, if P, then Q, okay? If not P, then, then Q. Therefore, Q. So if P is P on the left side, not P, and then the right side is Q. Now, it's interesting in this that Q follows from this. You don't need any other premises. Q follows from these two premises. There's nothing formally mysterious about this. Whitehead and Russell proved this proposition in 4.83, Proposition 4.83, in Principia Mathematica in 1910. But people who define presupposition presupposition in this way, do not understand that Q follows logically from 1 and 2. And it's because of this understanding that they'll write things like this. They'll say, hey, P presupposes Q, first premise, second premise, P. And then Q follows. And then they'll try to show you that it has some kind of like mysterious logical feature to it. Because look, we can put P in and we can deduce then Q. But we could, if someone says, oh, I deny P, 
Well, then we can just switch not P in, and it still follows. And so P presupposes Q, it's supposed to have some this like mysterious form that's not deductive. But it is deductive. And we'll, we'll, we'll show, go back and show that again. But this is what Bonson's talking about. And this is what's talked about in the other literature and books that have been presented, trying to get at the form of Van Til's apologetic. They will talk about this right here as showing that it has some kind of unique logical feature that's distinct than a deductive argument. But it's not. So going back then to Bonson's uh, quote, Notice this. This is what he's talking about. It is extremely important to notice and reflect upon the point being made by Van Til at this juncture. As we shall see shortly, a transcendental argument has this special logical feature about it, that it can draw its conclusion from the affirmation of some position or premise, as well as from the denial of that position or premise. That's what just what we, we were showing. P presupposes Q, and look, from P we can get Q, or from not P. So you can reject premise two, fine, we'll just, we'll just put in not P and we still get Q. But this is still deductive, okay? Well, all you're doing is you're just hiding the two implications in premise one. Well, just list them separately, which is what you should be doing, which is, lot, is deductive. There's nothing mysterious about this. Okay, so then from there, you wanna insert P to then get Q. And then you would do that through modus ponens, okay? Premise one, premise three. Notice though, then you don't need premise two. And then someone wants to insert premise three and then get, or, or sorry, insert not P to get Q, and then you would use premise two with premise three. Again, you're using modus ponens. But notice premise three, if you accept one and two, is entirely superfluous. And the fact that you insert P or not P as a premise shows you don't understand that P presupposes Q is enough. If you prove both of them, if P then, not, if P then Q, if not P then Q, you prove both of those, then you already have Q. You don't need premise three. I cannot stress enough the importance of understanding this. This misunderstanding is common amongst Vantilians and greatly hinders their presentation of Vantil's apologetic. If you desire to advance Vantil's apologetic, then you need to understand this point. If you do not understand it, then I would keep going over it until you do. Otherwise, this confusion will plague everything you do. And I mean this in Christian love, as a brother trying to help my fellow brother to advance Van Til's apologetic, you gotta, clear, you gotta clean this up. If you don't clean this up, it's just gonna be with you in every presentation that, that you give. Now you may hide it, but if someone presses you on this point, it will be exposed every single time. All right, moving forward then. Van Til's argument can be presented in this deductive form, right here that we're seeing uh, before us. Now, to make it explicit, we're gonna give P and Q meaning. Right now they don't have meaning. So let's replace P with K and C, or and uh, Q with C. So if there is knowledge, then Christianity is true. If there is not knowledge, then Christianity is true. And from that, if we could prove one and two, then, then it would follow logically that Christianity is true. But notice though, this is not the only form of Van Til's direct uh, version of the argument. This also works. If K, then C. K, therefore C. Now, <clears throat> this is the form that most transcendental arguments take. If you go into the analytic philosophy literature on transcendental arguments, they mostly take this form. They don't take the previous form. And, and the transcendental premise is premise one, right? There's something that's necessary for knowledge or for language or reasoning or, or experience. And what the right side is, whether it's some truth in the world or some belief, dictates then whether it's a truth-directed transcendental argument or a belief-directed or some other directed form of transcendental argument. But that first premise is the key premise. And then two is, is what needs to be affirmed, or what's, what the skeptic is gonna allow, let's say, to be affirmed. All right, now, if we make good on this argument, which we did earlier in the series, would it be true to call the truth of Christianity a transcendental of knowledge? 
Yes, of course. If we make good on this, the truth of Christianity would be a transcendental of knowledge. That is how Kant used the term transcendental, and that is how analytic philosophers, analytic philosophers use the term. Now, would we also then call it a presupposition of knowledge? Yes, we would. But wait a minute. We haven't proven, though, that C follows from not K. And we defined earlier presupposition as needing to follow from K or not K to be a presupposition. So apparently C is not a presupposition yet. Of course, that's foolish. Of course, that's a presupposition. And this, again, exposes the inaccurate presentation of what a presupposition is. And it's really to confuse the meta level of what's, what's going on. And again, we'll tackle that later. The question then should, be, should come across your mind of, well, how many forms of the argument are there? How many forms are there of this direct version? So if we move this over, so this is if k, then c, k, therefore c. Now to state this to save room, I'm going to change if then to just this arrow. Don't get scared about this. This is just k implies c, or c follows from k. So if k, then c, k, therefore c. And then so if k, then c is the first premise, k is the second, and then the three dots are just the, the therefore. So c is the conclusion. All right, so that's one form of argument that we just talked about. We introduced before that the if k, then c, if not k, then c, therefore c. So that's the next form. There's also a third one, if k, then c. And then we have if k, then c, then c. So c follows from k implying c. And then through modus ponens, uh, you would get c as well. Now notice, though, this middle, argu this middle argument, the, the, sorry, the second and third argument. Compare these two. So the first premise is if k, then c. So those are obviously the same, logically. But just looking at it, would you think that if not k, then c is logically equivalent to k implies c implies c? <laughs> that c follows from k's implication of c? No, I don't think it, it would seem to follow just looking at it, or that, that, that these, these would be logically equivalent. But they are. If you make a truth table of both of these propositions, they are logically the same. When I first did this, I'll never forget just being utterly surprised that these two are actually the same. All right, so, so these two are actually the same form. So to my knowledge, there are, there are two forms of this, this direct version of Antill's argument. And I've tried to, pr to prove both of them. So I spent more than a year trying to prove. So when I was working through, though, this first form on the left, if k, then c, k, therefore c. As I was trying to prove this, I was trying to prove k because I thought I was not allowed to hold it as an assumption. And when I realized I could not prove it, I wrote this off as a lost, basically, attempt or form for, for, to work for Van Til's argument. Then I worked another year on this other form, and then I realized it was quite elusive to prove. It's actually very difficult. It's much more difficult to prove if not k than c than to prove if k than c. And then I went round and round and I tried proving uh, if k than c implies c, tried to work with that, and it just wasn't, it wasn't working. Now, thankfully, Wittgenstein opened my eyes to why we are allowed, in fact, we must assume that there is knowledge. There's nothing wrong with assuming that there is knowledge. And once that landed, the argument could be, could be put together, could, could come together much, much quicker. So the first form is correct after all and can be used. Wittgenstein, I cannot stress this enough, is irreplaceable in a number of pivotal areas in performing Van Til's proof. Praise the Lord for common grace. Praise the Lord. Okay, we'll stop here. Next week, we'll continue on with additional cleanup work. For more content like this, you can find us on x at underscore language games. See you next time.